he, uh, if you will, he departed. He ran away from those duty. But in his running away, he came to meet a man named Paul. Amen, somebody. And in his encounter with Paul, uh, he was converted and he became a Christian. And uh, we looked at this morning the fact that it was ironic in this that the name Onesimus means profitable. It means useful. Uh, so in this lesson, in this morning's lesson, we uh, looked at the fact that we all, in a sense, before uh, we came to Christ, uh, were useless. But in Christ Jesus, he has now made us useful. Amen, somebody. Amen. So uh, as we looked at uh, the conversion of Onesimus, um, we looked at uh, that and understanding uh, that God has brought all of us who are now in Christ Jesus again. He's brought us from being useless to being useful. Amen, somebody. But there's another uh, theme, and it's the most obvious uh, theme of this book, which again is a personal uh, letter. It's a personal appeal written from Paul uh, to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. And Paul is now writing to Philemon, and he's going to send Onesimus back to Philemon. And he's letting him know that where he wasn't useful or profitable to him in the past, he's definitely, because now he's in Christ, he's definitely useful and profitable now. But the theme is forgiveness. Because the last uh, time that um, Philemon uh, encountered Onesimus was when Onesimus left. And as I said before in verses 17 and 18, the inference is that he had Onesimus had wronged Philemon. So again, I said this morning, when I can just imagine when Philemon gets this letter and Paul is asking him to receive back Onesimus, Philemon has to be thinking, man, the last time I saw this guy, he mistreated me. And now you're sending him back. Well, I don't know if I'm ready for him to come back here because the last time I seen him, he did me wrong. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? So this is uh, what we're uh, talking about them. So uh, understand that uh, when we talk about this subject, forgiveness, you know, it's, it's funny how everyone believes and says that forgiveness is truly a great thing, and it's a wonderful thing until they themselves are faced with the task of having to forgive someone. Is that something? And according to the context, uh, again, of this letter, Philemon was wronged by his servant Onesimus and was likely, most likely, quite upset, angry, and disappointed, as we all would be if someone wronged us. Amen? And therefore, because of these issues that had occurred between them and their relationship, in many respects, at this point in time, their relationship would be one that's fractured. Are y'all getting this? Amen, somebody. So understand that when we talk about forgiveness, forgiveness is essential for the restoration of a right relationship between two people. Is that all right? But most of all, most of all, it's essential for the restoration of a right relationship with God. I want you to look with me in Mark chapter 11, real quick. Mark chapter 11 and the verses 25 and 26. Mark chapter 11 and the verses 25 and 26. We can't forget that in any situation where wrong is done to any of us, amen, among us, that is done first to God. Are y'all getting this? Mark chapter 11, verses 25 and 26 says this. And when you stand praying, what does he say? Forgive. 
if you have anything or ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Is that what he says? So in other words, Jesus is saying, when we stand praying to God, make sure that you forgive anyone who you have anything against. Make sure you forgive them. Does this mean that they have repented to God? Does this mean that they've come to you and asked for repentance? No, this doesn't mean that. He's talking about our posture. Leave the responsibility that the other person has. Leave that with God where it belongs. But when he's talking about us and our posture, when we come to God, he's saying, I want your posture to be when you're asking me, make sure you forgive them. Are y'all getting that? Notice why, verse 26. But if you do not forgive, did you get that? Neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Hmm. Now let's look at Colossians 3 and verse 13, which says, make, and I'm reading this from a different translation, make allowance for each other's faults. King James uses the word forbearance or forbearing one another. But it says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. Amen, somebody. You see, we have to understand, therefore, that failing to forgive, holding a grudge, harboring resentment for another person, for another individual, not only can become an emotional cancer, but most of all, it has the potential to become a spiritual cancer to your and my own so, yes, sir. Yes, sir. you see, when you and I harbor resentment and even hatred for someone, in many respects, as we learned in our Saturday WVBS's class, when we harbor that within ourselves, in many respects, the person that you're holding that for or harboring that for, they own you. Did y'all get that? They own you. And you and I can become so embittered with someone that we are ourselves consumed with them to such a degree that in many respects, they live rent-free in our own minds. Did y'all get that? And this is why Paul in Galatians chapter 5 in the verses 13 through 15 says this. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to liberty or called to be free, but do not use your liberty or your freedom to indulge the flesh. Don't use what Christ has given you. He sets you free from the captivity of sin. Don't use it to do what you want to do. But by love, or rather serve, One another humbly, how? In love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But notice what he says. But if you keep on biting and devouring one another, watch out. Or you will be consumed by one another. Notice he says, don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, but he says, rather serve one another. You see, that lets us know that it's up to you and I to make the choice. Are y'all hearing this? It's up to you and I to make the choice, rather, to serve one another in love. It's our choice. 
It's our free will. It's our choice. Is that all right? And this is important because when he says serve, I want you to understand what this word serve means. This word serve derives from the root word doulos. When we understand that, that means a bond slave. Amen, somebody. All right? Here in this context, it means to, notice, submit. It means to yield. It means to surrender one's obedience and will. Notice this over to the governance of the Lord God. Why? In order to be able to perform the Lord's required services of Christian love, mercy, kindness, and forgiveness. In other words, God is telling you and I, In order for you and I to serve him properly, we have to submit our obedience and our will over to him in order that we might be able to perform what he requires. And guess what? What God requires is non-negotiable. Amen, somebody. And that's why I want to call your attention just real quick. Just real quick. You say you ain't in your lesson yet? No. (laughs) Philemon, verses 8 and 9. Real quick. Watch this. Philemon, verses 8 and 9. When you have it, say amen. Amen. I'm going to read this in a different translation. Is that all right? He says, I therefore, and, and remember, Paul is writing again, a personal letter of appeal and a plea to his brother in Christ Philemon on behalf of Onesimus, who was formerly a servant of Philemon, but he ran away. But when he ran away, he wasn't a Christian. But now that he's met the Apostle Paul, he's been converted, and now he's useful. He's even serving Paul while Paul is there in prison. And Paul is saying, I'm going to send him back to you because he's useful for me, but I know he'll be more useful for you now. Is that all right? So notice what he says. He says, I therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such one as Paul, the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So understand then, first and foremost, that we need to understand in what Paul is saying, that as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as I said this morning, Paul not only had the God-given authority to order and command Philemon to do what was fitting and proper and appropriate, or right in accordance to God's standard, he could have told him, listen, I command you to do this. And guess what? As an apostle of Christ, he had the authority to. But he chose not to do that because guess what? When we ask someone to do something, we want them to do it of their own accord. We don't want them to do anything begrudgingly or of necessity because what we know, God loves a cheerful giver. Is that all right? So he says, rather than command you, I want to appeal to you for love's sake. Is that all right? But I want you to know another thing also. Also, in the fact, not only is he, uh, could he have commanded him, but also in the fact that Philemon himself was indebted to Paul. Look at verse number 18, verses number 18 and 19. He says, speaking of Onesimus, if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. In other words, if he did you wrong, if he, if, when he left, when he departed, if he stole anything from you, put that on, charge it to me. Put that on my account. Verse 19 says, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it in full. Is that what he says? In other words, whatever he owes you, I got it. 
I'll take care of it. I'll pay it in full. But notice then what Paul says. Notice what he throws in. Not to mention to you that you owe to me your own self as well. Another translation says, but don't forget you owe me your life. Is that all right? Have you ever had to ask a favor of someone who owed you a lot? And then they act like they don't want to do it? Y'all ain't getting this. Maybe I'm in the wrong audience. Have you ever asked someone to do you a favor? It ain't even really big like that. You've been, they're indebted to you because you've been doing things for them all their life. But then you go and ask them, hey, I need a favor. Oh, I don't know if I can do that. Lord have mercy. But notice, he is appealing to him for love's sake. You say, well, what is that? It refers simply to the basic principle of Christian love. He's making an appeal to Philemon on just the principle of Christian love. Hey, I'm testing the sincerity of your faith in Christ because you already know it's the right thing to do. Is that all right? Okay. And that basic principle of Christian love is the foundation of Christ's love. It's the love of God and the love of Christ Jesus. In other words, we have to remember, he's trying to get him to remember, remember God's love for you. When you think about receiving Onesimus back, and if you have any apprehension on forgiving him, remember the love Christ gave to you. Is that all right? So he's saying, may this love, the love of Christ, the love of God, may it have an opportunity to influence you in this situation in order to help you to make the right decision and understand the power of love. And this is why Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8 says this. He says, above all things, have fervent love one for another. For love, notice, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Did y'all hear that? Another translation says it this way, above all, have fervent and unfailing love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. It overlooks unkindness and unselfishly seeks the best for others. That's real love. Amen, somebody. We know that 1 Corinthians 13 and verses 7 and 8 says this, love never gives up. Never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Love never fails. Amen, somebody. You see, the point is this. Onesimus, uh, to you and I, with Philemon, Philemon, or Philemon, I should say. Their relationship here is a pattern for you and I today of second mile forgiveness. Amen, somebody. Even though Onesimus was the bond servant of Philemon, Paul reminds him, and you and I today, that we must never forget and we almost always must be mindful of the fact that we are also bond servants to our Lord. He's our Lord and master. And therefore, you and I must be strategic in our prayers and asking God for his help with our spiritual growth. Amen, somebody as we grow towards Christ's likeness, and in particular, in particular, 
when it comes to our forgiveness and condemnation of others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen, somebody. There are some people who have done absolutely wrong to us. And God still says, forgive them. We have to be careful. We have to be, like I said, strategic in our prayers to ask God for his help with that. Because if we're not careful, then we will wind up condemning people. And that's not our place. That's reserved for the most high God. As we close, turn with me to Romans 14. Familiar passage. Romans chapter 14. Watch this. Romans chapter 14. And we're going to start with verse number four. We're going to look at verse four, then we're going to drop down to verse seven. Romans 14, beginning with verse number four. If you have it, say amen. Amen. Bible says, who are you? We can just stop right there. That's a sermon within itself. Who are you to condemn Someone else's servants. Did you get that? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. You see, You and I need to understand that we don't stand or fall to anyone in this life. Amen, somebody. God's approval and God's condemnation is the only ones that you and I need to concern ourselves with. I don't need to worry about, and you don't need to worry about meeting my approval. I don't need to worry about meeting your approval. I don't need to worry about you condemning me. You don't need to worry about me condemning you. We need to be concerned with God's judgment. What he thinks. And this is why he says in verse 7, drop down to verse 7, for none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, notice, we are the Lord's. Amen, somebody. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the living, of both the dead and the living. Notice this. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, each and every one of us. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God or give praise to God. So then, each of us will give account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop condemning one another. Instead, listen to this, make up your mind not to put any, not to put any stumbling block or a cause to fall and the way of a brother or sister. Did y'all get that? We're going to give an account to God who is the righteous judge. So we have to make up our mind. Knowing that, understanding that, recognizing that, you and I have to make up our minds to live our lives in such a way that we don't put a stumbling block or cause the fall in our brother or sister's way. 
Amen, somebody. And that starts with forgiveness. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. You say, well, why do you keep harping on this? Because sometimes when we think of wickedness, when we think of the things that God will judge and send people to the lake of fire to, we don't think that unforgiveness is wickedness sometimes. But an unforgiving spirit is wickedness. I'm here to tell you. On yesterday, in our first, second, third John and Jude class, in verse 7 of Jude, it talked about the vengeance of eternal fire. God's vengeance. And it made me want to put that into this lesson. Because as I said before, many times we don't take unforgiveness seriously. Okay? We sometimes can justify having an unforgiving spirit. And let me, let me say this. It goes beyond that because sometimes in that whole spectrum, I may, you may make up your mind to say, there are certain things that I just won't do. Y'all hear what I'm saying? But I'm here to tell you, whatever God requires, whatever he in, instructs us and commands us, we better do it. And if we struggle with doing it, we better ask him to help us. All right? I want you to look with me in Revelation chapter 14 as we close. All right? Revelation chapter 14 and verses 9 and 10. Because this is where we went in our lesson on yesterday. When he talked about the vengeance of God. And basically, it's against all those who refuse to obey God's word. And I want you to know that refusing to obey and heed God's instruction in any aspect of life is, in fact, wickedness. Y'all getting that? Revelation 14 and the verse number 9 says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on, their, on his forehead or hand, notice the next verse, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Notice this. Which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. You say, well, why is this so important and for, so critical for us to get? Because many religions today teach that the lake of fire, Gehenna hell, is just something that's a total annihilation or destruction. God just sends us there and he destroys us. But that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Bible teaches. Understand this. The punishment that God will render is first perfect. You say, what do you mean by perfect? God will punish us perfectly according to our wickedness. And for those of us who are Christians, 
it will be worse. Jesus said, you will be beat with many stripes, having known the truth and refused to do it. Are we getting this? So his punishment is perfect. It's going to be with full strength. Are y'all getting that? Full strength. Because he's talking about wine, and he says, no admixture. So full strength, 100 proof. Are y'all getting the drip? Amen, somebody? God, when he punishes, it's going to be with everything he's got. And you know how much he can do with just a little. But it's going to be with full strength. And notice this. His punishment will be without mercy. Lord, have mercy. Without mercy. And again, in the opposition to what many religions teach, that it's just a one-time thing. God's just going to destroy you, and that's it. You go, it's going to be like you sleep. Yeah, keep on thinking that. It is a continual ongoing experience forever because notice this true punishment is not known felt or experienced unless your and my soul is conscious of it so what are you saying in the lake of fire those who be who are going to be sent there will be conscious the entire time. And this is why Jesus said in Matthew 13, 42, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now I took the liberty to look this up. Weeping is wailing, but understand what it means. Weeping here in the lake of fire is the experience of bitter grief that springs from feeling utterly hopeless, remorseful, and regretting. And it is brought on by uncontainable emotion and psychological pain. Sounds like the rich man when he said, I'm tormented in this fire. And we know that that's uh, not necessarily verbatim or, or, or exact language. In other words, he remembered that I, I could have did right. And actually, from the context, it infers that he was a Jew because he said, Father Abraham. So how bad will it be for us if we're in the lake of fire, amen, somebody, knowing that we were members of the body of Christ? Amen. Gnashing of teeth is a metaphorical description of how those who are eternally condemned and will be cast into the lake of fire will express notice will express their indescribable anguish, agony, and despair. What you and I, God forbid if we go there, will experience there will be indescribable. No words for it. I had to share that with you. Because many times you and I struggle in this flesh. And we struggle, if we're honest about it, to a point where we become set in our ways. To say what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. I'm here to tell you, hearing this, you will have eternity to think about it. Amen, Amen somebody? Amen. 
That's not meant to frighten, scare, make you do anything that you don't want to do. But God always warns us before he destroys. Why? Because he loves us. Amen, Amen somebody. I've said enough. Consider where you are. Consider what's going on in your life. Consider anyone that you may have any issues with. What I'm recognizing about me, it's not about you, but what I'm recognizing about me is the biggest issues that I have are because of me. If I struggle with something, it's because I've yet to surrender myself and submit myself properly to the Lord. You say, well, why do you say that? Because Paul, remember, said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So there's nothing in this life that's too hard for God. Nothing. The only thing there is is things that we ain't going to do. Amen, somebody. Maybe I should look this way. Because when I said things we ain't going to do, everybody went like this. Some of you may be thinking I'm talking to specific things, but the truth of the matter is we all have issues that we need to further inspect. Because I'm here to tell you whatever it is in this life is not worth that. It's not worth weeping and gnashing of teeth. Lord, have mercy. Is that all right? I've said enough. Again, consider where you are. For those who have not obeyed the gospel, you have the blessed opportunity at this moment. Tomorrow's not guaranteed to you. You're not here by accident. You're not here by coincidence or happenstance or anything like that. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God has allowed you and I today to hear what he has to say. Amen. We may say to ourselves, well, you know, I'll wait and we hear it again. Well, guess what? You may not get another chance. Amen. No day you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Harden not your heart. And that's not just to unbelievers. That's to us who are believers mm -hmm. who have some things to reconcile with God. Amen. Amen. Somebody. Is that all right? Okay. So for those who are here who have not obeyed, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. With our belief to what we heard through faith, we can believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, be willing to repent of our sins, confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, the fact that he is the son of God and God raised him from the dead on the third day, and then in obedience, be buried in baptism for the remission or forgiveness of our sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the Lord, Acts 2.47, when we do that, the Lord is faithful to his promise to add us to the church. The church. Not a church. The church. The body of Christ. The church of Christ. Amen. Amen, somebody. For those of us who have obeyed, but we're struggling in some areas, please, please, I beg you, let's pray. And when we pray, let's be serious to ask God to help us with us. Amen. Amen, somebody. Consider that as we together stand and sing the words of encouragement. To hills for you.